track. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Maurice. All right, go ahead, Liz. All right, good morning. I'm Liz Kukla. I'm the Secretary of the Board of Zoning Appeals. I'm going to read the preamble for you this morning, August 16th. In compliance with notification requirements of the city's open meeting law in section 101.021 of the codified ordinances of Cleveland, Ohio, 1976, notice of this meeting has been publicly posted. All boards and commissions under the purview of the city planning department conducts its meetings according to Robert's rules of order. Actions during the meeting will be taken by voice vote. Abstentions from any vote due to a conflict of interest should be stated for the record prior to the taking of any vote. In order to ensure that everyone participating in the meeting have the opportunity to be heard, we ask that you use the raise hand feature before asking a question or making a comment. The raise hand feature can be found in the participants panel on the desktop and mobile version and activated by clicking the hand icon. Please wait for the chair or facilitator to recognize you and be sure to select unmute and announce yourself before you speak. When finished speaking, please lower your hand by clicking on the raise hand icon again and mute your microphone. We will also be utilizing the chat feature to communicate with participants. The chat feature can be activated by clicking the chat button located on the bottom of the WebEx screen. Call-in users can unmute by using star six. <clears throat> Next screen, Mo. All meeting activity is being recorded via the WebEx platform. These proceedings are also being live streamed via YouTube for public view. We have also provided a link to the meeting for those who wish to speak on a particular case via our website and email. All requests to speak on a particular matter have been considered. We have also received emails from those who have provided written comments on a particular. Yes, we can hear you. Next screen, Maurice. Unless you think I should read that again. Okay, Madam Chair, are you ready for me to call the uh, uh Yes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Barnes? Here. Ms. Faith? Present. Mr. Donovan? Yes. Ms. Britt? Here. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Great. And so, Madam Chair, this morning we do have one postponement request. That is for calendar 21-120 regarding 2280 West 6th Street. And the, the owner, Aaron Price, proposed to erect a four-story frame single family residence. The applicant and the council person have requested a postponement to allow time for the community to review the project. All right. Um, Without objection. Are we thinking, <laughs> are we thinking uh, 30 days? Did you give them a date? Uh, September 13th would be the best, I believe, Madam Chair, as the the 30th uh, ha is, is very full. So the, yeah, uh, I, want, I don't want full agendas like that. Okay, let's move it to the 13th. September 13th. Thank you. Thank you. Without objection. <laughs> now I will say without objection. <laughs> without objection. Without objection. Without objection. Thank you. Okay, so we're uh, going to start with Councilman Jones here. We're going to start Alana with the uh, calendar number on 118. Three. Correct. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, we're beginning today uh, since we have Councilman uh, Jones present. We're beginning with calendar 21 118 <laughs> at 3343 East 140th. All Car Equity Limited owners proposed to establish use as a residential facility for up to 16 occupants in a B1 two family residential district. The owner appeals for relief from the strict application of the Cleveland Codified Ordinances as stated in the agenda and the public record, of which there are three. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. Everyone for this case who's going to testify. Kindly raise your right hand. I'm going to uh, give a statement. I'm looking for a response if I do with your name. Here we go. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Name? Althea Buffert. 
Anyone else? Councilman? Tiana. Please use star six to unmute yourself. Yes. Could you repeat that, please? I believe Kiana Jones also said I do. Uh, Councilman Joe Jones, I do. All right. Anyone else? Uh, Antonia Curtis for Henry Curtis, I do. All righty. Anyone else? For the case on East 140th Street. Can you hear me? Yeah. Your name yeah. is. And... Okay. Anyone else? Marcellus Woodson. I do. Good morning, Kendra Anderson. I do. All righty. Anyone else? Taylor Riggins Walker. I do. I All think. Right. Is, is this for the East 140th Street? Because it seems like a lot. Yes. If, if you're not here for the East 140th uh, case, we haven't gotten to yours yet. So you don't need to do that. You don't need to swear right now. Any any last comers to be sworn in for East 140th? Hearing none, we go to history. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. I would just like to point out um, in the legal description, I think it's important to note that section uh, the, the appellant is requesting a po uh, variance for from section 337.02H, which states that any residential facility for any occupancy as defined above is not permitted if located less than 1000 feet from another residential facility. I thought it should be important to note for the for the public uh, that the proposed facility uses within 1000 feet of three other residential facilities, including the Wright Family Home at 3324 East 140th Street, Simmons Adult Care at 3274 East 143rd Street, and Every Joy Adult Family Home at 3391 East 147th Street. And uh, so I'll go on to the history, Madam Chair. Uh, the property was originally zoned multifamily in 1929. In 1959, it was changed to the two-family district. In the Records Administration Office, I found that in 1926, a permit was issued to erect a dwelling and garage. And in 1963, a permit was uh, issued to demolish a one-story frame garage. And in 1979, a permit was issued to erect a chain-link fence. There are no variances on file for this address. And in the more recent history, we found that a certificate of occupancy was issued in 2005, stating that the authorized use of the property is as two dwelling units. And also, Madam Chair, I do have two letters. That's uh, just, just to note that I would like to read those when the uh, public comment is uh, nearing an end. So just wanted to let you know that, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Kukla. Uh, legal standard, please. <clears throat> Madam Chair and members of the board, Apollon is requesting a use variance and an area variance from the spacing regulations of the zoning code. To obtain a use variance, can you hear me? It's, it's very muffled. Can you hear it's me? It's cutting in and out. That's good. It's on. It's on now. That's it. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, Christ. We can hear you, Lori. Yes, we can hear you, Lori. Oh, you can. <laughs> I'm having trouble with this. It's 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 cutting in and out a little bit, but go ahead. Um, Staying use variance. All of us heard that denying the request will result in an unnecessary hardship, particular to the property, such that there will be no economically feasible use of the property without the variance. Will deprive the appellant of substantial property rights, and the granting the variance must be contrary to the purpose and intent of the zoning code. To obtain the area variance, appellant must prove that denying the request will create a practical difficulty not generally shared by other land or buildings in the same district will deprive the appellant of substantial property rights and the granting of variance will not be contrary to the purpose and the intent of the zoning code. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Okay. Um, who's going to be the spokesperson for this case? Spokesperson? I can. I can be. My name is William Walker. You're the spokesperson for this case? Okay, go ahead, present your case. 
Okay, I uh, brought some uh, some folks from our team with us, and including uh, Dan Bickerstaff, who uh, of Creative of uh, Ubiquitous Construction, our uh, architectures. I've also brought Joe Johnson from uh, uh, Creative Builders as our contractor. We have put together a plan. Um, I wanted to to first give you some history of uh, my father. William Walker, um, his his practice, it's been at one six six one five. Uh, Madam Harvard. Chair, yeah, this uh, sounds weird. Is this for the East One Fortieth Street case? No, oh, no I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, this right. is so, right. That's why I thought we had too many. A so, lot of so we're here. we're dealing with East One Hundred and Fortieth Street. So I think that's the agenda. I'm not sure if you guys. That's the right. item we. That's the item we, we're. That's the case we have right now. So if you are and, not. Involved with the East 140th Street case, mute your phone and your case will come up soon. If you are involved with the East 140th Street case and this is your case, I need whoever the spokesperson is for this case to now present, please. And, and Madam Chairwoman, just for clarification, this is a, a, a variance request. This is Councilman Joe Jones. This is a variance request to put a group home here. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yes. So who's the spokesperson for the group home for East 140th Street? Ms. Buford, are you on the line? Yes, I'm I'm on the line. Okay. Okay. All right. So I guess I'm gonna be the spokesperson. Okay. This is Althea Buford. My name is Althea Buffert. 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 Okay. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Okay, uh my name is my name is Althea Buffert. And I am a uh, part owner of Alcar Equity, which uh, we own the house uh, at 3343 East 140th Street. I'm also part owner of ACT Cares LLC, um, which we have a, an adult day program where we service individuals with disabilities. And we have, um, we're establishing a relationship with Under One Roof Foundation um, in order to uh, place some individuals, you know, in the home, you know, in order to have, you know, those uh, have services in the home, you know, with them. Uh, what we what we found with the, I guess, with the with the variant, what why we requested the variance is, um, I guess, when you when you all found that there were three um, facilities operating, I guess, within a thousand feet. There, the one facility that is down the street from us, um, I believe it is the, let me see, Wright Family Home at 3324 East 140th Street. That, um, that facility only services the elderly. This, um, this residential facility would be, uh, it would be servicing young people of working age, you know, like that would be going out into the community, you know, being of service to the community, you know, going out having jobs or, you know, just doing things out in the community. So this would be a younger population. Um, it would just not be surfacing the elderly. Um, the other residential facility, the other residential facilities, um, I believe that one is not open. Um, Kendra, can you? Tell me which one is not open, no longer operating. Yeah, Ms. Buford and Madam Chair, I apologize. So one of the facilities that they have listed, um, it's no longer in existence. And the other is actually over uh, a thousand feet. Um, and, and it is open. However, again, their, their, their target population are senior adults um, over the age of 65, a little bit more sedentary than the population that under one roof foundation proposes to serve at the 3343 East 140th Street property. So that's why we're seeking variance as it pertains to this property because again, our target population with under one roof foundation, the tenant to out carry um, equity uh, it's between the ages of 18 and uh, 45. Uh, there is uh, a, a lack of 
cost efficient, safe, affordable housing for adults with developmental disabilities in the Mount Pleasant area. Likewise, um, those adults have opportunities, as Ms. Buffer stated, uh, to be engaged in their community, whether it's in supportive employment uh, or transitional employment or access to day support uh, employment. And so our tenants would in fact be, or our clients in fact would be again, like she said, active in the community, not sedentary um, and, and needing to engage in the community rather than sitting solitaire in uh, an adult day support facility. Uh, Ms. Buffer, can you um, address, you know, your business hours for, for this, uh, for this home as well as why you you want 16 it doesn't seem like the house could house that many people so just explain what you plan to do with this home um how you plan to staff it you know business hours are you administering medication like can you just give us an update on on that kind of stuff okay so that i i believe there was kind of a misconception so it says I, I guess where the rules, I, I mean, I guess where it's written up, it just says up to 16 individuals, but there would there would not be anything close to 16 individuals in the house. Um, I believe there are there are three bedrooms. It's a you know it's a um, a six two. So there are three bedrooms, one bathroom upstairs, three bedrooms, one bathroom downstairs. So in those three bedrooms, I believe. There could be maybe like five, I think five people upstairs and five people downstairs max. So there would not even be anything close to 16 people. Um, with working with under one roof um, foundation, we would, they, they actually would, we have a couple of our, we have a couple of our individuals that would be staying in the house where we would be providing our own staff for those individuals and then under one roof, under one roofing foundation would be providing the staff for the rest of the individuals that they would be bringing in. And so we would come together and we would have, you know, we would have our own, you know, staffing hours for that. So for example, you know, we have one individual that, you know, requires overnight staffing hours. So we would have overnight staffing you know, for that individual, some individuals do not require overnight staff. And so we also have, med you know, medication certification. So if there are, you know, any individuals that need medication, you know, and everything like that, we have staff that are medication certified. So all of that, you know, basically we come together, each individual has what's called an individual service plan. And what it does is it takes it, um, it tells you basically what things that they like to do, the things that um, it's, um, what do you say? Um, it's basically- well, I, I can add to that. I can add to that if you want, Ms. Buffer. And to speak to uh -huh. Madam Chair, specific the staffing hours, if you will. So mandatory staffing uh, per Ohio Department of Mental Ms. Health. Anderson. Ms. Yes. Anderson, normally you have to be addressed by myself or, or uh, Maurice to speak. Um, so just be cognizant that if you're going to um, interrupt Ms. Buffer, that you have to say who you are because we do have a reporter that keeps track of everything everyone says. So when you do speak, just say your name, we'll know. Okay, great, my apologies. Thank you for advising me regarding the protocol. So Kendra Anderson for Under One Move Foundation. And to answer their question is it, or add to the question in terms of the staffing plan. So according to Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities, mandatory staffing is required to be on staff during the hours between 4 p.m. Um, and 11 p.m. And, and, and in those waking hours when we are receiving clients, coming in from work or their day activities. Likewise, mandatory staffing will be required during the hours of 11 p.m. to 7 p.m. And two individuals, one on the first floor, one on the second floor unit would be in place during the sleeping hours of 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. 
during the day hours again, 4 p.m. to 11 p.m. to receive adults or individuals coming in from their adult day activities and their and or their work activities. And there, yeah, there was a typo on the application. So there's not going to be no more than eight individuals with uh, developmental disabilities um, living um, on site at 3343 East 140th Street. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any residents uh, here that would like to speak? Yes, you do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, my, my name is Anto my name is Antonia Curtis. Antonia. Uh, yeah, A N T O N I A. Middle hey, can you give us your address, please, Curtis? Three three four one East One Hundred and Fortieth Street. If you look at the picture you have up, our house is the one if facing the house, the one to the left. The yellow and blue house. Okay. All right. Go ahead. That is 12 feet, eight inches in uh, separating our property from the property that you're speaking about. I have a question. Okay. My question is when was the initial application for the zoning variance or the initial application for the group home submitted? I can't see that. Madam Chair, I can answer that. Go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Kukla. Thank you, Madam Chair. The application to building and housing was made on June 2nd, and our office received it on July 19th. <clears throat> okay, the reason why I'm asking the question is that house had been empty. We have lived in this house for 36 years. The husband inherited the home from his mother. He grew up here. So basically, the Curtis family has owned this house for over 60, maybe 70 years. Um, the house at 3343 East 140th Street sat empty for approximately 12 years. The previous owner, Terrell James, uh, refused to rent it and he refused to sell it. After he had a stroke, his daughter took over because she had power of attorney and she allowed the house to go into foreclosure. And so things proceeded from that. Um, I guess what I'm getting to is if the application was um, dated June 2nd and you received it in July, why would Alcar get to an individual tenant on the first floor? And now they're going through all kinds of different manipulations to have this woman move but they're still accepting rent from her. Uh, Ms. Curtis, that's a personal matter that um, we don't really review here for zoning. So if you can just let us know if you have an objection or support um, the group home going in next door to you, uh, we have will help out. We have a strong objection. Okay, thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Uh, is anyone else uh, residents here on the on the call today? Yes, my name is Catherine Wright. Catherine Wright. Okay, I'm go ahead. ahead. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I can have your address. Yep, go ahead. Oh yeah, thirty three twenty four, thirty three twenty six East one hundred forty. Shall I read my letter? Um, if you, or you can summarize it on on how you feel about okay, it. Okay, summarize it. Um, I'm like. Parcel number 1301103. So I'm about maybe 200 feet away from this house. I have adult care facility here that I've been here for over 20 years. Um, I'm objecting to this because number one, um, I am allowed to take sex offenders and I do have a sex offender. Um, and the reason why I'm, I'm objecting to it because Yes, some of the stuff on the letter from the zoning is wrong, but you do have a, another facility, this adult care facility at parcel number 1301112, which the address is 3467 East 140th Street, and it's owned by CCF Management, and it's been there for quite some time. So um, 
what I'm objecting to is another type of facility like this on this street because we have two already, and one is in close proximity to my house. The other one is down there near the corner of my kinsman, it's like in between. So um, with one of the problems is so many in this area, um, and what I mean by that in 44120 along, it's 32 facilities. And within a 20 mile block, there's another 20. So between 135th and 154, you have all these adult care facilities. Well, what happens is a lot of people don't wanna move in an area where there's a lot of adult care facilities because the clients we treat have mental illness and various uh, disabilities. So the property value has went down because of what's going on now. And I object to this facility being across the street from me. Thank you. Thank you. Any other residents on the call? Okay, if not, uh, Councilman Jones, we can hear from you now. Well, uh, Madam, I, I, sorry, Madam Chair, I believe we did have a few more people. Maybe they're having trouble. Um, you I'm sorry, Madam Chair, um, it was my mic was muted. My name is Monday Workman Swopes, and I'm on behalf of my parents, Robert E. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Can you give us an address, please? Shoot, they live at 3347 East 140th Street, Cleveland, Ohio, 44120. And uh, I believe I have your letter up. Yes, that is my parents' letter. Um, and they have lived in their residence for since 1977. They're both elderly and they live right next door to the house that's in question. And they strongly object to this being approved. Thank you, Ms. Um, Ms. Kukla, do we do you have any other letters or is this the only one we have on the screen now? I do. I have one other letter from Asia Shadid Bay. Um, if you don't mind, I'll read it. She is the owner of 130-11-103 and co-owner of the adult care facility. Is this the person that just uh, spoke? Yes, I'm her mother. She, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Madam Chair, I guess I would not read it since okay. she already made her comments. <laughs> yes. All right. So that was the only letter you had, Ms. Cooper? Yes. The other letter I had was from um, Ms. Workman. Okay. And she made her comment. All right. Uh, Councilman Jones? Yes, thank thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, and pertaining to this issue, as well as listening to all the testimony today. Boilerplate the plate and rebuilding the neighborhood and um, adding value to the community. Um, the issue here is that the neighbors directly are going to be impacted by it. But you're cutting in and out, Councilman. Is anybody else hearing him? No, we can't hear I you, can't Councilman. Hear Councilman, you're cutting oh. in and out. Right. Can you can you hear me better now? Can you hear me yeah, better I now? I want to. Yes. You kind of. Kind of. <laughs> okay. Can you guys hear me better now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, the the issue at hand right now is, and it's something that has has been an issue for our community. I'm quite sure a number of other communities is the the saturation of group homes, um, various different type of uh, daycares and uh, and the like. And what that has done has uh, disrupted the quality of life for people who actually are homeowners and living in their properties. Um, the citizens in in the in, in these areas, are, you know, have seen the value of their properties go down as it relates to a number of group homes and businesses being able to operate uh, as a business function right next door to them. Uh, the problem with group homes that we've that I've personally had, had to deal with is uh, people not taking care of their clients. So their clients are walking up and down the street. They're not on their medication. And they're disruptive to the community. 
there has been a number of issues. And, and in fact, uh, at nighttime, I've had to go out and deal with some of those issues with some of the clients uh, screaming to the top of their voices uh, in the neighborhood, disrupting the entire community. Um, so with that being said, in addition to the objection of those who live right next to the group home, uh, we, we will be in opposition uh, when any neighbor who lives on the street or especially next door to a, a proposed facility, uh, we will be in objection to it. And we are always in objection to any property uh, that uh, is in or near around a new one being established uh, less than a thousand feet. And the whole purpose of the rule was to make sure that our entire neighborhood is not oversaturated with group homes. Um, so, uh, Madam Chairwoman, on, on the strength of the neighborhood and those who own their properties uh, and for the sake of um, um, establishing stronger property values, um, our community, Ward 1, will be against any type of these uh, properties being put or established in our communities. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Councilman Jones. Uh, board members, any questions or comments? Uh, no questions or comments, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I think we can move to uh, uh, make a motion. Uh, Madam, Chair, go ahead, Ms. Madam Chair, just real quick, I wanted to also mm -hmm. add that um, when I took the pictures, I met the two folks that you see on the front porch. Uh, I, I assume they are current residents of the building. Um, they had no idea uh, that this was happening. Um, so I, I don't know if they're going to be evicted or what if you're if you're using both the up and down uh, portions of this building. Um, we definitely object to the use of this uh, of this building based on the uh, councilman's objection and also the surrounding neighbors and the the wonderful people that I talked to uh, when I went out and took the pictures. Thank you. Yeah. Somehow I skipped over city planning. Sorry about that, Maurice. <laughs> no problem. It's easy to <laughs> <Thank> do. <you. laughs> okay, Miss Faith, go ahead. Okay, uh, Madam Chair, given the testimony that we've heard today, um, uh, strong objections from the uh, adjacent neighbors. Uh, we have just heard the testimony of city planning and um, the, uh, the statement by Councilman Joe Jones. Uh, I move that we uh, uh, not approve this variance. Have a second. Second. Okay, call the roll, Ms. Cooper. Mr. Donovan. Yes. Ms. Barnes. Yes. Ms. Faith. Yes. Ms. Britt. Yes. Calendar 21-118 is denied. It'll be ratified next week and we will send you a letter. Okay, uh, Ms. Faith, moving on to Councilman Brancatelli's uh, case. Uh, uh, oh, we, we actually have, a... have another Joe Jones. Yes, we have a second oh, case do? for, yes, we do. Oh yeah, Harvard, sorry about that. Sorry That's about okay. that. Sorry, Councilman Brancatelli. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hold on, hold on a little second more uh, there, Councilman. Okay. I'm even more forgettable than planning, so. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the good humor, Councilman Brancatelli. Uh, moving on to uh, Councilman Joe Jones' second case. Calendar number 21-126 at 16615 Harvard Road. William Walker, owner, proposes to establish use as a restaurant in a B1 local retail business district. The owner appeals for relief from the strict application of the Cleveland Codified Ordinances as stated in the agenda and the public record, of which there are four. Thank you, Ms. Faith. Uh, Mr. Donovan? Anyone who's going to testify for this case, please raise your right hand. I'm going to read a statement. Looking for a response if I do, and your address with that response. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes. Your name? Dan Bickerstaff. And your address, Dan? 3443 Lee Road, Shaker Heights, Ohio, 44120. Thank you. Anyone else? Edward Riggins. Ed, your address? 38340 Tomarack Boulevard, Willoughby, Ohio. 
44094. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Oh, you're more. Colina, Rick and Sorry. One, one at a time. Go okay, ahead, Colnita. Colnita Riggins Walker. Press. K O L N I T A R I G G I N S hyphen Walker. Your address? 3073 Van Aken Boulevard, Shaker Heights, Ohio. Four four one two zero. Thank you. Anyone else? William Walker. William, your address? Three zero seven three Van Aken Boulevard, Shaker Heights, Ohio. Four four one two zero. Thank you. Anyone else? Yep. Martha Fields, City Planning. Thank you, Martha. Anyone else? Councilman yes. Joe Shamovic. Your address? Uh, address I'm I'm calling about uh, I, I'm the owner of 16621 Harvard Avenue Harvard Road okay that will that'll, that'll suffice last call anyone else for this case councilman Joe Jones somebody's got a phone there's, a, there's another person that wants to get on but he's having trouble getting on it's Frank Bradshaw with BLA properties and he's also the owner of um, the property next door 16621 Harvard but I'm not sure why he's not on I just talked to him and he's been having trouble trying to get in all right well when he shows up we'll swear him in okay what else besides that and by the way somebody's got their phone on you there's noise bleeding into our this is councilman Joe Jones so I just want to be registered in as well Thank you, Councilman. Tristan Riggins Walker. Your address, Tristan? 3073 Van Aken Boulevard, Shaker Heights. All right, thank you. Again, last call. Anyone else? I'll go ahead and register as well. I'm not sure if I will offer testimony, but my name is Traver Riggins. Okay, your address? It's 2708 18th Street. San Pablo, California. Oh, wow. All right. Last, oh. last call. Yep, I'll go as well. I'm not sure if I'll offer testimony, but um, my first name is Taylor Riggins Walker. Okay, and your address? Uh... My address is 598 North Avenue in Wakefield, Massachusetts. Oh, okay. 01880. The family reunion on this one. <laughs> All right, any last, last, last call? Yes, last call. This is Richard Goudreau for the Harvard Community Services Center. I was trying to get on. Uh, okay, you your name was noted. Thank you for making the executive party. Thank you. All right, that's it, I think. Onward to history. Thank you, Mr. Hi. Donovan. Oh, no, go ahead. I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. The property was originally zoned general retail in 1929. In 1958, it was changed to local retail. In the Records Administration Office, we found that in 1937, a permit was issued to erect a single family brick veneer dwelling. There are no variances on file and nothing of note in the more recent history. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Kukla. Legal standard, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Helen is requesting area variances from the Austri parking and landscaping regulations of the zoning code. To obtain the area variances, the appellant must prove that denying the request will create a practical difficulty not generally shared by other land or buildings in the same district, will deprive the appellant of substantial property rights, and that granting the variances will not be contrary to the purpose and intent of the zoning code. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Uh, Maurice, can we have a summary, please? Sure. We're uh, proposing a new restaurant at this location. The primary um, uh, variances here are the fact that there is not being, uh, there will not be any parking provided uh, for the restaurant behind the building. There was an existing parking lot that's going to be removed and I believe turned into outdoor dining. Um, and there's also the uh, eight foot wide landscape uh, 
transition strip in the rear. Great, thank you. Uh, who's going to be the spokesperson for this project? I will. Colmita Riggins Walker. Okay, Colmita, go ahead and present the case. Hi, good morning, um, the chair and all who are here. I appreciate you. Um, so um, what we're proposing is that um, dad has been, William Walker has been in the building uh, for uh, seven decades and the, the building is originally was zoned as commercial property. The, um, he's been a dentist in the Lee Harvard community um, since the mid 60s, serving the community and he's never retired. Dad is uh, 96, he he's actually still with us thriving and um, was diagnosed with terminally ill third stage four cancer back in 2016 and he's still thriving. Um, he's been a pillar in the community. He's been serving the community, like I said, for several, several decades and um, he's never retired and he, due to COVID, he wanted to go back into the office, you know, so who am I to tell um, him that that's pretty much not going to be feasible. Um, so the long and the short of it is, um, I, I just have to be very honest that, you know, I I don't know any other way to be. So I, I was grieved and I went to the office uh, to check the mail and to check up on the property, maintain the property. And, um, you know, it was really in my heart, you know, to have something for him. And I literally, honestly, I just saw a vision and I saw a vision of this beautiful upscale restaurant that, uh, had valet that was very um, uh, a bright spot in the community and I went home and I shared what I had seen with dad and the family and uh, dad's reply was oh you mean like Lancers and I said no dad it's going to be better than Lancers and he <laughs> said you know I always wanted a restaurant and we the family didn't know so hence, um, he finally um, agreed uh, that he would be okay with uh, turning his practice, which is really his heart, his baby, is what he's done all his life, you know, and, you know, um, helping to be able to bring a bright spot for him to the community. Uh, we are looking to operate um, our clientele, our market, um, is going to be to the um, middle age, um, upper class to draw around from the, not only from within the Lee Harvard corridor, but also the surrounding communities. We've done several market analysis with data research asking the community. We were featured on Kicking It with Kennedy, Kenny um, in the spring for the Cleveland Eat Explorer and um, so, and the community is really excited because there's really nothing like this in the corridor. Um, and um, they're, they're just really looking forward to that. Um, also, there's, if, if I would have an opportunity to be able to introduce Dan Bickerstaff, who is our architect of Ubiquitous Design, and we also are partnered up with the Harvard Community Service Center from the beginning. Um, I did approach the, the house next door to the east at 16621 um, way back in the spring, and I spoke with a young man and, and told him our vision under the impression that they were the owners of the house. Um, this was given to me uh, to, you know, be proactive, getting data research to find out what the community wanted and, um, and even the property to the west where there's another commercial little strip. I spoke with uh, Sadiq, he's the owner of the African store. I spoke with a tenant um, who was um, in the salon in that strip and they're very excited, all on board, looking forward to us coming to the community and if we could have an opportunity, you know, to be able to, and we also have the support, uh, hopefully, um, of uh, Councilman Jones and, and we have also secured parking across the street with the uh, Lee Harvard Shopping Plaza. We have contract with them. We are also partnered up with the storefront renovation program as well. Thank you. Uh, I assume, uh, Mr. Bickerstaff, you can go through the actual variances here. 
Oh, you're muted, Dan. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present this exciting project to you guys. Um, yeah, I'll launch right into the variances before I really talk about the architecture. Um, the first two um, non-conforming items pertain, obviously, to parking. There was an existing parking area in the rear of the building to the north, which we eliminated and created an outdoor oasis for the facility. As you can see, the lower right photograph depicts that area. Uh, so it is, has been enhanced through the architecture. We can just go back to the site plan. So again, Planita mentioned that we were able to mitigate the site plan, which is, yes. We're able to mitigate that uh, issue by acquiring parking spaces within the plaza across the street. You'll see in the image to the right where you have the numbered parking spaces that were allocated initially. We had 20 spaces that were um, part of the lease, but I believe that the lease has been expanded to 32 spaces that renders um, item number one um, a moot point and item number two as well, uh, I hope, because we had to eliminate the rear parking for the enhanced dining experience. With regard to item number three, which uh, pertains to the eight foot wide transition landscape strip abutting um, the residential um, district. As you know, the residential district is directly to the north of the property, which is up, and to the east, which is to the right. Um, we were able to achieve the eight foot landscape strip to the north. You can see the islands of landscaping in the rear, and there's simply a gap in between. And I'll walk you through that how we were able to eliminate um, a seating component and simply extend the landscape strip of both east and west to fall into conformance. And obviously item four uh, pertains to the city planning commission approval and our historical renovation approval. And I'm sure Mark Phils can elaborate on that. But if we can zoom back out, Maurice, and sort of walk through the concept, which Clonita and William, you know, upon entering the building, they mentioned that several architects basically didn't see the vision and basically indicated that uh, it wasn't achievable given the size of the building, which is 1,470 square feet. Um, but I knew it was possible. So if you go next, Maurice. So what we did, there's an existing entryway that has um, a hip roof. So what we did was try to articulate that and expand on the existing um, interesting characteristics of the building. So we created a uh, elongated canopy structural, which uh, has two columns and then attaches to the building and uh, maintain the existing roof hip configuration. The existing driveway will now become uh, outdoor seating as well. We've located the trash imposer um, as far north as possible away from the structure. And again, the outdoor dining experience is enclosed with masonry piers, decorated fencing, decorated um, metal fencing. And you can see the bar configuration, which will have a canopy as well. One of the other interesting features about this outdoor scenario and circulation is that we created a, a sloped sidewall condition on the east side of the property and extended the decorative metal fencing, which allows one to penetrate the rear space and created a small stage for outdoor entertainment um, during the summer. And you can see with the- Madam, Madam Chairwoman, uh, uh, I don't see the photo in front of me. I still see the old house uh, that's on the board from before. I don't see the new photo of what you're explaining. Can we put that up, if possible? Um, um, it's been, yeah, it's on been my moving. screen, Dan. Dan, do yeah. you see it? Yeah, I see it. Yeah, that's what I'm speaking to. I don't see mm. that. It's sort of uh, uh, lavender and purple. Um, I don't see it. Oh, why? We see uh, yeah, it. I don't. I don't know why that is. It's. It's. I can see it on both YouTube and. Uh, 
and on my screen i don't i don't know i can't tell you what's going on what about you colnita can you see the new design unfortunately i'm not able to be on video uh, for some reason the web link just keeps spinning and spinning several members weren't able to get on it just says it keeps connecting um but we're, we weren't able to get on to video i am and here. Well, we're, yeah, well, we're saying it, so go ahead and continue, Mr. Biggerstaff. Yeah, and just a um, high-level overview of the, the floor plan configuration. You can see we created an open space. Um, the existing building um, has quite a few different office spaces and operatories. So we went in and planned to remove all the existing non-load-bearing partitions, as well as one load-bearing partition, and augmented the building with structural columns and beams to support the group. In that lavender purple area where you see the lounge, where the bar stools are and the open seating, we removed the ceiling in that area and established a cathedral ceiling effect. So it conforms to the existing hip roof configuration. Um, the area in pink are existing stairs. We've added two toilet facilities, one specifically for women and obviously the handicapped accessible toilet room. And you can see to the north, we have our very robust kitchen with all the components that are required to operate the facility, as well as an, an appendage to the north, which it, um, constitutes the freezer cooler component. Next, Maurice. And if you can zoom out. Yeah, and if you can just keep it summarized, we don't need to get into the details on the Excellent. inside of the building. Look at the elevations. You can go next. I reviewed that. We've pretty much reviewed that floor plan ceiling. These are elevations um, of the um, facility as it's going to be augmented. You can see the canopy. We utilize the Corinthian, not Doric columns. Um, to match the existing pilasters so that are there flanking the door. So we've taken the vocabulary of the building and extruded it and created this um, gabled canopy component. And the lower portion is just a real elevation showing a movable glass wall that gives access to the stage and the outdoor bar. Next. Side elevations illustrating the extruded canopy primarily. And you can see the fencing with the masonry piers. Next. This is a perspective illustrating the um, front facade. And as Colina mentioned earlier, we will be reducing the tree lawn for a uh, drop off concierge um, component for the project, which has been accepted by the storefront renovation program. So we're excited about that, that feature. So that concludes our presentation. I don't really need to go into the details. But Great, thank you. Um, we have several family members on. Um, I think Comita did a very good job on giving us the history of the building and, and why you wanna do it. So if there is anything extra you wanna add that she didn't already say, you can move the case forward. Um, um, go ahead and speak. Hi, this is Colnita. I just wanted to add also before the family members come on is that part of what is so wonderful about um, this project is that dad is still with us and we really wanted to honor him and be able to give him a living legacy. You know, many um, in the African American community and many just outside of it, you know, sometimes we uh, don't have an opportunity to give a living legacy. We will give a legacy after someone has transitioned on to the other side of this earth. And so uh, we just really want to be able to move that vision forward and lead in for him, to allow him to be able to hopefully, God willing, see his living legacy come true. Thank you, Colby. Thank you. Um, any other family member wants to speak about, uh, about this and uh, briefly so we can keep moving? Bill. Uh, Madam Chair, I do have a, a comment. Sure, go ahead, Ms. Cole. I do not have a copy of a uh, parking lease agreement or a valet program. Yeah, I was going to bring that up later after people had a chance to speak, but thank you. Thank you. My name is Ed Riggins, 
Um, and I'm part of uh, Conita's immediate family. And I'm excited about the idea of bringing a fine dining establishment to the Lee Harbor area. I'm a previous restaurant owner and owning my restaurant in basically a black community, I would have friends ask me, Ed, if I want to take my family out to dinner, recommend a nice restaurant to go to. And they know I own a restaurant, but they didn't consider my restaurant equal to the task of a place that they could take their families to. So my hope and my belief is that we can establish a restaurant in our own community that when people want to go take their family out to dine, they can come to the Lee Harvard area within where they pay their taxes, where they do their shopping, and a dollar will be turned over and over again. How many of our dollars uh, when we spend go outside of our community? With this particular project, a dollar will turn itself over a number of times before it goes outside of our community. Thank you, and Mr. Thank Riggins. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, we got Mirka here. Mirka, you want to chime in? Um, particularly on uh, a few things that Mr. Bickerstaff talked about. Um, yeah, so we, um, th this, uh, this plan has actually gone through our, um, the storefront renovation program. And so when it does that, it does not go through the local design review committee, but, um, I've been in touch with storefront renovation and, uh, talking with, um, Conita throughout the process and, um, they have, uh, met a lot of the, um, requirements needed in terms of finding additional parking um and the uh, i know they were applying for the um drop off at in front of the building the for the uh, valet parking um it's an area where you don't have a lot of sit down restaurants and upscale restaurants in the neighborhood so i think it would be a great addition to the neighborhood um and it's also uh we've done an overlay district here um and so um, for any new construction, the number of parking spaces that are required wouldn't necessarily be required, but this, this is an existing building. Um, so we are, we're supportive of what they're proposing. It's um, like I said, I think it'll be a great addition to the neighborhood and, and um, they have come up with an alternative solution for parking. So we, um, we don't have any objections. Thank you, Marka. Uh, Mr. Bickerstaff, do we, is there a lease or some kind of um, agreement that you can get to BPA about the parking? Actually, I just emailed it to Ms. Kukla. She should have it in her system right now. Fantastic. Thank Thanks, you. Dan. Uh, sure. Councilman Jones. Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Donovan. Do you want to hear from the board before or after the council? Uh, after. Okay. Madam Chairwoman. Yes, sir. We're in 110% um, support of uh, this project. Uh, it will be one of the first type of small restaurant businesses that come in our community since 50 years, uh, where we will have an opportunity to have fine dining. And uh, it's these small projects, and if we can build enough of them, we can hopefully rebuild our neighborhood like Tre Tremont has done. And so um, I'm in support of it, and I'm in support of the variance changes that are being uh, spoken about here uh, this, this morning. Okay. And Thank you, Councilman. Uh, all right, Mr. Donovan, go ahead. Yeah, the only yeah. Uh, thing that caught my ear was uh, the outdoor entertainment aspect of the project. And is there uh, some kind of hours of operation when the, where the neighbors can anticipate that there won't be any loud music, et cetera, et cetera, to come off of it? I didn't know if that was addressed in the write-up or not. 
Um, so yes, we are planning um, to have uh, entertainment. This is Colnita Riggins Walker, and one of the things that you know we really want to bring and change the atmosphere of what Lee Harp for some of the uh, con concepts of Lee Harvard community is that uh, we're safe. You know, we're building and we're bringing revitalization into this community. And so, like I said, the, our crowd that we're anticipating our market. Um, our target market is going to be, you know, more mature uh, families are welcome, you know, professionals and where we also are going to have security there, you know, not looking intimidated like security, but really uh, our security guards will be masked as doormen. And so, um, you know, to bring that safe element of safety, we will have um, our hours of operation, our um, going to be, we're primarily going to, going to be open for either lunch or dinner, but initially probably just dinner since we're just opening. And then our dinner hours will go from five, our kitchen will close at 10 o'clock. And then it, uh, entertainment is usually going to be during the, either like a preset of, um, uh, early dinner and then maybe during dinner. Um, we plan to have, uh, indoor. Uh, entertainment and and we don't anticipate that is going to be anything excessive that that's not our style. You know, we really want nice dinner music, nice jazz, um, nothing like, um, you know, we're, we're not a hip hop scene. No offense to all the hip hop lovers, but that's not who we are. You know, we really want a nice fine dining establishment with families and professionals and uh, the community and um, and partnering with the community where we're looking to even have community events as well. Yeah, I was just concerned more with the any permitting type of uh, language that needs to be obtained to have entertainment. And especially an outdoor patio. I think the city has its own set of criteria there. And I just wondered if that was embedded into the project itself. It's not written, it's not written up as a outdoor entertainment situation. So I, I think they're okay. Madam Chair. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Yes, Madam Chair, we would have to defer to um, Mr. Riccardi as to whether or not the entertainment was added um, on the original application. It was All I see on the application are is the outdoor patio. We don't see any, um, you know, uh, place for a, a stage or anything like that, uh, which would trigger the review. So. To Mr. Riccardi, is this um, is this something that would need an additional review, especially in a local retail business district? Is is outdoor entertainment or live entertainment a permitted use? This is Richard Riccardi. Um, the entertainment use was not mentioned, neither on the plans or the application. It is a use that is not permitted in the local retail business district. So you, you should realize that if, if, if you're going to grant this and mention it and it's discussed, uh, please consider that you're also granting and uh, it, it should be considered you're also granting use variance for, for an entertainment use it would not be permitted in this district. Thank you. And Madam Chair, to the, to the attorney then, uh, this probably should be, and she can verify this, but this probably should be re-advertised as the uh, the neighborhood would not have been aware of the entertainment, as again, it was not on the um, on the public notice. Well, I think, Miss, this is Dan Bickerstaff, architect. I think that uh, maybe we place in a bit too much emphasis on the entertainment. It's just the music that accompanies any restaurant establishment. Um, right, that's that's what I was going to try to clarify. Is yeah, you marketing this is like you're going to have you know bands every week, or are you just like piping you know, uh, Spotify through some speakers while people are eating. So that's what we need to clarify. And if that's what you're doing, then that's not entertainment, and we right. can move forward. But if you're talking about you're going to, you know, hosting you know, 
bands, you know, three days a week or that kind of stuff. That is actual live entertainment and we'll need to um, re-advertise. Yeah, so that, you just clear, clarify what you're going to be doing with it. That is not the approach. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that, I would yes, suggest there's is. probably two thing, two ways to tackle this. Uh, who's One. Speaking? Who's speaking? Tim Donovan. Okay. Uh, thank you. There's two ways to tackle this. One, we could just deal with the case as is this not addressing the live music and they could come back and for an additional variance just on that issue if they'd like well i um this is I think that's a good approach. yeah and i would have to say to agree with dan that it's not something where we're planning on having a lineup you know what i'm saying we're not that kind of environment we really are looking to have soft music nothing loud we're not we we are not anticipating um late night hours number one for sustainability you know we we are we are of the mindset to be sustainable and to be folded into the community so uh and part of that is taking care of our employees and so we don't want our employees to be working these long excessive hours and these excessive shifts it's unrealistic and which is one of the biggest concerns of people who work in the restaurant industry is that they work too long of hours and so um i i would think that you know, just for the sake of nice dinner music and something that's soft. I, again, we don't anticipate even being in the building literally past 11. I don't want to work those late hours. Okay, thank you. Um, Madam Chair. Uh, before that, I see that Marka Fields had her hand up. Marka, did you want to say something else or was that from previously? That was just previous. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. This is Liz again. If the appellate could just clarify, are these going to be bands? Are there going to be, you know, even if it's a string quartet or a uh, person with a guitar, I believe that it's still considered live entertainment. Um, I'm not sure that something over a speaker system is still considered live entertainment, but it is considered when it's a uh, a group playing instruments um, and it would need to be reviewed again. Then I would have to answer that and say it's a firm no. Great. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, now that we have that uh, clarified, uh, board, if you have any more questions or comments, if not, I can entertain a motion. Well, Madam oh. Chair, my name is Frank Bradshaw, and when you were, uh, and uh, Art Shamovic, who is the mortgage holder on this property, uh, he and I, uh, I have spoken with Councilman uh, Jones uh, in the past few days, and the only concern we have, the property immediately to the east uh, is a single family residence. And uh, the concern that, uh, was, that we've raised is the eight foot wide transition landscape strip. And this says it's proposed not to have one. And so we're trying to understand how the opacity between the commercial restaurant and the single family resident next door is to be contained. Uh, there's, and Mr. Shamovic is on this call also, but just on the phone. And between us, I don't think there's any, and I, I should men, indicate that my uh, involvement was that when VLA services uh, bought the property with the intent of reselling it to somebody, Mr. Um, uh, Shamovic who was the mortgager and has re, uh, the mortgage holder and has retained that function. And he actually uh, handles most of the business transactions having to do with the property at this point in time. So the only question in all of this is maintaining that, uh, you know, that transition between the restaurant and the single family residence and it, and the impact of the restaurant on people actually living in that single family residence. Now, I know that there's been some contact between Mr. Shamovic and uh, Mr. Walker's family, but that's been very recent. And so I don't have any information as to where that might go. So that's, that's the only question. So if anybody- okay, wants, thank Thank you, thank you, Mr. Bradshaw. Uh, I believe Madam. Mr. Victor staff covered that, but um, uh, well, Dan, if hand you can, again. Yeah, if you can uh, address that, please. Thank you, Mr. Bradshaw. Good question. The distance between our 
structure and the property to the east is four feet. So it would be impossible to have an eight foot wide transition strip to begin with. Secondarily, we created a raised platform there and we're framing that with a decorative metal fence. If there's a concern, we could possibly investigate a board on board fence to, to sort of increase the opacity. But we thought the decorative metal fence would be more aesthetically pleasing, especially as you move along Harvard westward to see that fencing moving to the north. And Connie, I don't know if you want to speak to that. But I, I, I don't have any real uh, comment in that regard um, other th than um, it, as long as the that this, that 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 separation is in fact well maintained, and sure. I don't mean I, I, be very clear and very to the to the to the, to the uh, residents in that single family residence. So other than that, um, I don't think Mr. Shamovic or I have any uh, objections to raise to the project. I mean, uh, may, may I speak? This is Arthur Shamovic. May, may I make a comment? Uh, very briefly, please. Okay, we we uh, you know really would support this type of project. I think it's great for the community. And in fact, I only saw it for a moment, but I saw on the application you were saying that if it, this doesn't happen, you would be deprived of the use of your property. But then again, you can't deprive me of my use of my property because you're going to be deprived. I believe that if you have that outdoor seating area. I will not be able to use my backyard anymore. We have the, the bedrooms are in the back. We open the windows, even if the windows are closed, you're going to have 50 people back there with, uh, you know, and you're serving alcohol. It's not going to be a whisper. It's going to be noisy. And if you're doing this until 10, 11, maybe 12 o'clock at night, uh, that's going to really uh, deprive me of my use of my property. So we've got to come up with a, a solution that, uh, you know, we can both live with and that it's not going to be noisy. And I don't know how that's possible. I, you know, we just had a discussion this morning about perhaps them purchasing the property, which is I think we should uh, investigate and, and move forward and see what happens before we rule on it and before anyone rules on anything. Perhaps we don't have to rule on it, and uh, you know, if they buy the property, they don't need that eight-foot uh, uh, fence. But but there's a reason why that that is in the zoning. It's it's not to deprive the next-door neighbor of their use of quiet enjoyment of the property, and that's certainly going to be a hindrance in in the use of the property. They won't be able to sit out in the backyard anymore. You've got 80 people. You've got a 50, at least 50 people out there. To late at night, you're saying now that you might have some music. It, it, it's going to be a, a, a real problem. So I would say that we, should, we need some time to discuss it between ourselves. I heard only from this morning at about 9 o'clock from the property owners from the Walker side. I think we need some time to discuss and see if we can't come to a better solution. I would like to speak on the current property, Mr. Shamovic. I'm, I'm, I, I appreciate your comments. I'm not quite sure when the last time you've been to the property. And so just in um, looking at the property, again, back in the spring, I did approach the young man who is the tenant, and I would assume he's still there. Um, I actually went just a couple of weeks ago and knocked on the door and no one answered. Um, I did not realize that you were not the property owner. Uh, and so, of course, it, this is just recent dialogue. What I can say as far as as you can see the well thought out planning and the design of docs on harvard is going to be a bright spot it is going to be attractive and you know what when we were you know uh, underway um the the current content of the property next door it needs some work um i'm going to say that there were mattresses out in the backyard there were uh, th things all over that was in disarray uh, when i spoke with the current tenant they were very excited they were very on board with us moving forward and i when that's tenants on both sides of the property to the east and to the west and so i do understand your concerns but i have to i have to just 
hold where we are and know that we are going to be a viable, very nice spot in the community that I don't think is going to be disruptive to your property. If anything, I think it's going to be a benefit and I think it's going to be an added amenity for your tenants. Oh, the, the, the tenant right now is a, is a, is a, a lady in her mid-60s and she's already told me she's petrified of this restaurant and she's going to move. So I don't know where you're getting your information from, but the lady that lives there is in her mid-60s. She's afraid of it. I told her it would be, you know, I'm sure they're going to be a nice. She says she doesn't care. The noise, the cars, the traffic, she's moving. So, okay, so sir. That's what I'm up sir. Against. Okay, sir, this is, you're going to have to, you guys as neighbors are going to have to work this out outside of the Board of Zoning Appeals hearing today. Um, but, uh, Dan, I don't know if you can address maybe some, uh, you talked about maybe changing the fencing so that uh, maybe to give that, that owner some more privacy as a residential house, if you want to address that. Sure, I, I would definitely have to huddle up with the owners of Docs and try to better understand how we can mitigate some of the concerns. But, well, you know, it's a general retail district. I mean, local correct. district. Correct. So correct. The use of this it's, as a restaurant is appropriate. How we deal with the, the issues at hand with the neighbor is something that should not stop this process, but we can deal with that offline is my hope. That's why we should uh, table it perhaps until we can work something out. Sir, you were not recognized by the by the chair. Please okay. order. Thank, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, if I may, uh, add Ms. Regarding Ms. Oh, sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I'm actually dug into the into the plan. I'm sorry, into the file, and I found that the site plan is slightly different um, from what was actually submitted to us in Building and Housing. They show a small um, green strip between the patio and the property line. I mean, I mean, granted it's like four or five feet, mm -hmm. and now that has actually been removed on this site plan that we're looking at. So well, um, well, we're not sure, is this something that building and housing may need to review again as that small strip is no longer proposed? I just sent that over to Maurice. If you guys wanted to take a look at it, um, it, it actually, it, could be a concern as it showed some buffer between the two properties. Who and owns that property? Sir, you have to wait to be Again. addressed. So please ask for permission to speak first. Uh, Dan, do you have a response to that? With no, the, the again, different plans? we can take another look at the landscape strip. I think um, there was a drafting component where we removed that to maximize the seating, but we can easily plug that back in. That's not an issue in terms of reintroducing that four foot landscape strip. But again, there's a there's fencing there, decorative metal fencing as well as masonry piers. So there's a strong investment along that property line in that area. So it's not something we're trying to um, reduce and, and avoid. Okay. Ms. Kuka. May I ask questions? Hold on one second. Uh, Ms. Kukla. Uh, Madam Chair, if uh, Mr. Rulins could um, show that on the on the plan so that you can get an idea of how uh, it, it's not a huge uh, strip of green space. And uh, Mr. Rulins could probably speak more to uh, what city planning might want to see as a uh, as a substitute. But that is the edge where the where the landscaping would be required. The eight foot landscaping would in fact be required along that along that um eastern or the right property line as that's where the two family districts start mm -hmm. i believe the two family district may uh, be at the rear two but an eight foot would be required we did yeah we did hear line. testimony that there's only four feet there and so that eight foot was not possible to do and so that they were going to do what they could within that strip um so if there are different if there are different plans, um, then the, the plans that we have before us today, are those the ones that were submitted to building and housing or the, the, these plans that Ms. Kukla are talking about was submitted to building and housing? The plans that were submitted by Ms. Kukla, you can see the small 
landscape strip there. And that's what you plan on doing? What we plan on doing is what we presented today. Okay. It's a small augmentation, but if there's consternation, we can possibly eliminate the uh, sloped walk on the east. Those are things that aren't really that big of a deal at this point. We still can get access from the driveway side. Uh, Maurice, have you looked at these? Uh, we just got these plans this morning. Um, and so I really haven't had time to look at them very, very closely. Um, the plans that Ms. Kukla was talking about had uh, in this stage area was all seating area. Um, so it's different from that respect. I, I, in my opinion, at least a uh, eight foot, well, I'm not eight foot, I'm sorry, uh, a board on board fence would probably help mm -hmm. uh, alleviate or uh, create the separation between the two uses. At least it would create more privacy for both the restaurant and the adjacent property owner. I agree. Yeah, which is um, part of that plan. That's right. part of when Dan said that he would plug in and that's part of the plan is to have a barrier and fencing to enclose uh, that area. Does right, yeah, Dan had Dan had mentioned a ornamental fence, which was probably more transparent. I think it needs to be whether it's ornamental or not in nature. I just think it needs to be opaque so that uh, I think it actually would benefit both places. I think if you're dining out there, you'd rather be in a more enclosed space. Mm -hmm. And I think for the for the uh, for the neighbors to the east, uh, they definitely are going to want to have an opaque barrier so that they can go out and enjoy their backyard. Uh, you know, without looking at at 50 people back there. And, and if I were dining at the restaurant, I wouldn't mind <laughs> a little privacy back there too. So I think it's a win-win for both if you put a, 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 you know, a solid barrier between the two, whatever kind of fence you feel is necessary, I'd leave it up to you, Dan. Sure. Um, but that that's my opinion. Yeah, we're I mean, not. I don't, think an, I don't think an eight foot strip is really gonna help in any way, shape or form. It's not gonna stop music or noise from going uh, back and forth between the properties. So. I think the fence is, is about as good as you can do in this particular case. Thanks, Maurice. Mm -hmm. yeah, we'll, no worries. Um, uh, the property owner, did you have something else you wanted to say before I close? Uh, yes, yes, this is Arthur Shamovic. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Uh, Shamovic. Okay, my question is, where is the property line? Who, in other words, where exactly is the property line? Do we know that? Where, who owns that four-foot strip? Is it, is it the dentist or is it the the property to the east? Which is my, I'm a, I'm it's the property. dentist. It's the dentist property. The whole thing. So, so our property ends at the garage. No, you have that. Property line is centered between the the dentist's building and your building, which is eight oh, feet. Oh, centered. So, and how big is that uh, grass strip? Is it four feet? Correct. Oh, so I own two feet of it, and you own two feet of it. You own four feet. I own four feet of it. Correct. Oh, so is there any of it that's yours? I said it was an eight foot dimension. Oh, total. I, oh, it's eight feet. I see. Okay, yeah. so four feet and four feet. Correct. Okay, thank you. We're, we're, we're done with that. We're shut down testimony. Uh, board members, uh, if you have any other questions, if not, I will entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I just had a quick question to Marka Field. I believe she stated that this has been placed in an urban form overlay. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, with that in mind, Madam Chair, given the testimony that we've had, uh, we've had uh, um, uh, an excellent presentation by the property owner. I think uh, Kalita is to be commended on her presentation. Uh, and thanks to Mr. Bickersfield for his uh, uh, clear delineation of the uh, uh, plans and um, the parking situation. Um, and the discussion that we just had on the barrier between the property. Um, I think the understanding is we're gonna to move to a board on board fence on that boundary. Uh, also outstanding are the, uh, the letters and lease agreements for the parking uh, for across the street um, that we would need to have before we could ratify, which is typical. Uh, given the testimony from city planning uh, and the 
support from uh, Councilman Joe Jones, I move that we go ahead and uh, approve the variances for this uh, for case number 21-126. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like, to make a, I'd like to make a second, but I have a question that just popped in my head here. And it has to do with, is, is this a pedestrian overlay that's, that they're referring to? That's an urban form overlay, Tim, I believe. Overlay, which helps, re it's, helps reduce parking, um, right. parking the, requirements. The reason I asked the question is for the valet, it's been mentioned that there will be a kind of a drop off driveway, if you will. Is that included in the plan here as well then? Yes, you can see it on the sheet before you. There's an indentation directly in front of the property. Okay. Really All right, just so it's covered. Yeah, I'm just trying to right. look ahead here. That's sure. that's part of the um, storefront renovation program. Mm. Okay, so we so, have a motion and so a second. Covered. Yep. Call the roll, please, Ms. Coakley. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just to be clear, we are going to hold this until we receive the site plan for the uh, showing the uh, board on board fence. I already received the um, lease agreement paperwork. Okay. Yes, I'm pretty sure they'll they can get that to you fairly quickly. Right. Okay. Great, uh, Ms. Barnes. Ms. Barnes, I can't hear you. Ms. Barnes, yes. Ms. Faith? Yes. Mr. Donovan? Yes. Ms. Britt? Yes. Calendar 21-126 is granted conditionally. It'll be ratified once we receive that le that revised site plan and we will send you a letter. All right, thank you everyone, good luck. Thank you, Madam Chair and Board. Thank Appreciate you. It. Everyone thank you. Have a good day. Now are we moving to Councilman Frankel Tally, yes. he has to wake up. <laughs> So, 8104 Madison, go ahead, uh, Ms. Faith. Okay, I don't have that in my printout, so let me just blow this up a little bit on my screen so I can read this font size. Calendar number 21-115 at 8104 Madison Avenue. Uh, this would be in Mr. Bracatelli's, Councilman Bracatelli's district. Uh, Izzy Holdings, parenthetically uh, National Foods, owner proposes to install a seven foot high ornamental fence in a B2 semi-industrial district and C3 general industrial district. The owner appeals for the relief from the strict application of the Cleveland codified ordinances as stated in the agenda and the public record of which there are two. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. Anyone for this case who's about to testify, please raise your right hand. I'm going to read a statement. I'm looking, I'm looking for. I'm looking for a response. Of I do, and your name. I do, and my name is uh, Nick Palace. I have to read a statement, Nick. Do you sure. swear or, or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I Nick? do, and my name is Nick Palace. I do, Councilman Tony Francatelli. Nick, could you give us your address? 8104 Madison Avenue. All right, Councilman, thank you. Anyone else? I do, Adam Davenport. Okay, city planning, I do. Okay, anyone else? Hearing none, we go to history. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Awesome. There's been no change in the zoning since 1929 in the Building and Housing um, Records Administration Office. I didn't find any records for 8104 Madison, but I did find uh, records for 8102, um, which is directly next door. So I'm assuming that it's all part of the, uh, the project area as it's a very large parcel. I found that in 1911, a permit was issued to a, erect a warehouse. In 1917, a permit was issued to, to erect a factory addition. Um, in 1966, there were interior alterations to a steel processing plant. Um, there are no variances on file and nothing of note in the more recent history. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, legal standard, please. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Appellant is requesting area variances from the fence regulations of the zoning code. To obtain the area variances, appellant must prove that denying the request will create a practical difficulty not generally shared by other land or buildings in the same district, will deprive the appellant of substantial property rights, and that granting the variances will not be contrary to the purpose and intent of the zoning code. Thank you. Um... Maurice, can we get a quick summary, please? Yeah, this is very quick. We obviously have a proposed new fence and it's simply <laughs> taller uh, than what's allowed by code. Thank you. Okay, uh, Nick, are you the spokesperson for this case? I am. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so uh, we want to put a brand new fence since uh, there was two cars that hit the existing fence and the existing fence is seven feet tall. And under the FDA, we have to, um, we have a food defense program. And since we are a manufacturer to uh, protect the manufacturing facility uh, a little bit better than the uh, six foot fence would. So we, are, we, we just want to replace the seven foot existing fence chain link to a seven foot or, or, ornamental fence. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Adam? Good morning. Uh, I think the, the ornamental fence would be great. Um, if they're under regulations to have a higher fence, uh, I think that might be fine considering they're in a general industry district. Um, with the height and respect to what our code says, maybe the applicant could move the fence uh, further off the sidewalk, creating kind of less of a immediate height barrier, if they'd be open to that. It seems like there's a just a grass landscaping strip behind the fence, so maybe that could be an option. But other than that, we don't have a problem with the, the concept. Okay, uh, Nick, did you hear what the planner suggested? I, I did, I just, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Just move the fence back, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think, I mean, normally our request would be in, in other areas that aren't general industry or because of other regulations to have um, a fence that would conform with the height code itself. Uh, so maybe as a part of, um, I guess, sort of honoring that rule in our code, maybe that could be moved further off the sidewalk to create less of a presence near the sidewalk. Since, it, since the, I know, I mean, the south side of it, this, the north side of the street is definitely a general industry area. The south side of the street is, is more of a residential area. If I may, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, sure, go ahead, Councilman. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, just to clarify, this is not my ward, um, uh, but uh, um, fully supportive of national foods. They're an important business um, in uh, Councilwoman uh, Jenny Spencer's ward. I have been in discussions with the councilwoman. And she's very supportive of these changes um, and uh, uh, worked very closely with uh, Click Fence, who is doing uh, the fence work for this property. Um, he's a local business in our community. Um, and just as a note, um, the notion of uh, moving the fence back off the uh, off its current location um, is impacted by a significant number of trees and utility cuts and poles that are there. So. The, the practicality of moving it back, uh, setting it back a little more would be um, pretty complicated. Um, so um, I don't know if you have the street view. Mm. Yeah, there you go. You can see the trees behind the fence now. Um, mm. And there's a, a utility pole in the upper left corner um, that would have to be relocated. So I think uh, placing the fence at its location uh, and seven foot um, commend uh, National Food for upgrading their fencing. Um, despite the fact that it's been hit a number of times by uh, vehicles, um, they're willing to make the investment to do decorative fencing there and the seven foot height, I think, uh, meets the guidelines for their uh, corporate responsibilities as the food processor. So um, fully supportive of, of the fence at its location at seven feet. Thank you. Uh, Adam, can you live with that since it will cause some uh, utility pole removal?
Um, I'm thumbing around on on Street View right now, kind of looking at that. It does seem like it would the uh, the utility poles and the trees would be in the middle of the area that you'd probably locate the fence in. So I yeah, I I, I think it's up to the applicant in this case, whatever they want to do, because otherwise you move the fence back to the uh, the asphalt in the parking lot, which would be then very hard to, and unnecessary to dig up just to locate a fence in. So we just want to replace the existing fence. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. All right, thanks, Adam. Uh, board, any questions or concerns? If not, I'll entertain a motion on this. Um, Madam Chair, I think it's pretty evident that um, uh, the trees would be compromised and the utility poles would be a big issue if we. Uh, didn't keep the fence in its existing location. Um, and um, I think it's to be commended that they want to replace with a decorative ornamental fence um, instead of uh, seeking out to replace with the chain link. Um, uh, thanks to Councilman Bracatelli for um, making statement on behalf of um, uh, Councilman Spencer and for waiting all this time to be able to speak. We appreciate that. And uh, with that, I move that we go ahead and approve calendar number 21 115. I have a second. Second. Okay, call the roll, Ms. Cooper. Ms. Barnes. Barnes, yes. Mr. Donovan. Yes. Ms. Faith. Yes. Ms. Britt. Yes. Calendar 21-115 is granted. It'll be ratified next week and we will send you a letter. Thank you to the commission Thank members. Thank you to the palace family. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think uh 21-121. That's where we are. Yep. Yes, yes. ma'am. Yes, that ma is that is correct. So moving on. Calendar number 21 121 at 5123 Ham Avenue. Elaine, no, Eileen Hamilton, owner, proposes to install a chain link fence in a B1 two family residential district. The owner appeals for the strict relief for, for relief from the strict application of one Cleveland codified ordinance as stated in the agenda and the public record. Thank you. Everyone for this case, everyone for this case, kindly raise your right hand. I'll read a statement. I'm looking for a response. If you're going to testify of, I do with your name and address. Okay, here we go. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. 5123 Ham Avenue. Are you there? Nobody home? Madam Chair, I do see Eileen Hamilton. She is the owner and I do see her on here. I, her name on the list of folks attending. Star okay, six, okay. if you're calling in star six to unmute yourself. Yeah, she. I don't see a microphone next to her name, so I don't know if she's- Hello? Up. There she is. Oh, thank you so much for telling me how to unmute the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for um, undo your name and address. Eileen Hamilton, 5123 Ham Avenue. Thank you. Anyone else? On to history. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. There's been no change in the zoning since 1929. In the Records Administration Office, I only found that in 1958, a permit was issued for a garage addition for a garbage container. There are no variances on file. And in the more recent history in 2012, a permit was issued to re-roof the property. 2017, a permit was issued to repair and replace four windows. And that's all that I have that's relevant. Uh, thank you. Legal standard, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Appellant is requesting an area variance from the fence requirements of the zoning code 
To obtain the area variance, the appellant must prove that denying the request will create a practical difficulty not generally shared by other land or buildings in the same district, will deprive the appellant of substantial property rights, and that granting the variance will not be contrary to the purpose and intent of the zoning code. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't think we need a summary on this one, uh, Maurice. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I don't think so either. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Ms. Ms. Hamilton, go ahead. Tell us what you want to do. Um, I want to have uh, the Northeast Ohio Fence Company professionally install a chain link fence along the western border of my property uh, and across the frontage of uh, the uh, side addition lot to the west of my house, as shown in this um, exhibit. Um, it would... Um, other fences are in the frontage of houses on my street, as shown in this diagram. Um, there are 21 fences all together, chain link fences. 20 of them have frontage chain link fences. Uh, there are only two frontage um, wooden fences in my immediate area. And um, I don't think that um, you're allowing me to stop, install the chain link fence across the frontage of my side yard will detract from the neighborhood. I am grateful that you are concerned about the the uh, appearance of the neighborhood, but uh, the city and county having demolished 12 severely blighted and vacant homes around me has done wonders. And uh, I have also uh, very concerned about my home and my neighborhood. I've replaced the foundation, added a new garage, concrete drive, new roof, chimney, gutters, soffits. The front of my house has been re-windowed and resided. And I don't think that my investing several thousand dollars more in a chain link fence will, will bring down the appearance of the neighborhood. Please don't view my neighborhood with a suburban lens because chain link might um, be negative in some areas to some people, but I don't feel it is negative in my neighborhood. And I need it. I need it to protect me from the trauma, uh, mental and physical, of the mental health and the substance abuse meltdowns of my next door neighbor, which is a matter of police record in the uh, several times in the last three years. And so I humbly ask you to please allow me to have a chain link fence across the front of my side yard and down my west property line. <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, Maurice Rowland, City Planning. Um, uh, when I went out and took the pictures, uh, I did notice all of the other chain link fences in the front yards that uh, Ms. Hamilton is talking about. And Ham is a unique street in that it has a lot of high, a lot of traffic on it because. I believe Broadway dead ends right into it, kind of. So, so it's a very high traffic street. There's a lot of pedestrian, um, a lot of pedestrians on the street. So we 100% uh, support the variance uh, for this for this fence. Thank you, Maurice. Uh, board, any questions or concerns? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I think uh, I think uh, Mrs. Hamilton came a very articulate. Uh, presentation and has covered all the bases on this and with the support of city planning and certainly uh, her safety in mind. I think it's important that we go ahead and approve uh, calendar number 21 121. Thank you. Can I have a second? Thank you so much. All of you. Second. A second. Thank you. Uh, call the roll, please. Ms. Kukla. Ms. Barnes. Yes. Mr. Donovan. Yes. Ms. Vay. Yes. yes. Ms. Britt. Yes. yes. Calendar 21-121 is granted. It'll be ratified next week and we will send you a letter. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Ms. Hamilton. Thank you. Good Stay luck. Safe. Okay. Okay. As we continue fence day here at BZA. Uh... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, this is fence day. That was that was my observation when I was looking over our agenda with with a couple of exceptions. It's fence day. 
Uh, so moving on to calendar number 21-124 at 16112 Chatfield Avenue, Andrew Hines owner proposes to install approximately 100 linear feet of four foot high wooden fence and 28 linear feet of six foot high wooden fence in a B1 two family residential district. The owner appeals for relief from the strict application of the Cleveland codified ordinances of which there are two. And with that, we can move on to Mr. Donovan. Thank you. Everyone for this case who's about to testify. I'm going to read a statement afterwards. I'm looking for a response of I do with your name and address. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Name and address. Andrew Hines, 16112 Chatfield Avenue. All right, Andrew. Anyone else? Uh, no, that's it. Anyone from the city? Madam Chair, I do see um, Councilman Slife. I have a Councilman and Adam Davenport as well. Yep, sorry. Adam, I'm here. Adam's here. We're here. All right. All right. Thank you, Adam. Councilman? I'm here as well. Okay. Well, and I do would help, help me here. Onward to uh, history. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. There's been no change in the zoning since 1929. In the records administration office, I found that in 1938, a permit was issued to erect a porch and stairs addition to a two family structure. In 1977, a permit was issued to erect a fence. There are no variances on file. And in the more recent history, I see that in uh, 2015, a permit was issued to uh, re-roof the property. And then in May of last year, a permit was applied for, and I'm not sure if it was issued, um, to change use from two family to single family. And that's all that I have, Madam Chair, back to you. Thank you, legal standard, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Appellant is requesting area variances from the fence requirements of the zoning code. To obtain the area variances, appellant must prove that denying the request will create a practical difficulty not generally shared by other land or buildings in the same district, will deprive the appellant of substantial property rights and the granting the variances will not be contrary to the purpose and intent of the zoning code. Okay. Uh, is it Andrew? Yes. Okay, go ahead, present your case. Okay, um, so I purchased this home in December of 2020. Um, I was looking to find more, some more space for my dog and myself. Um, so I plan on, you know, building this fence in January of 2021, I bought the materials in February and I was, it's just been kind of a difficult process to get it done. Um, Lowe's could not find an installer for me. So I requested them to send me the materials and I've had problems finding an installer myself. So I'm, I plan on installing it myself. Um, I just had difficulties uh, getting the permit approved for the plan that I have. Um, I understand that um, the rule is that it needs to be four feet on the sidewalk. Um, the reason that I do want it six feet is because I'm worried about my dog, her ability to jump. Um, actually, last year she jumped a three and a half foot balcony uh, ledge pretty easily. So, you know, I don't want to be worried about that. Um, I also would like it to be, you know, a privacy fence because she's a bit of a barker. Um, and, you know, I don't want her bugging the neighbors all day. So the fence is essentially for her, you know, and my neighbors. Um, if I didn't have a dog, I wouldn't be requesting a fence. So that's essentially it. But. So oh, you started, you started building this already. Um, is that what I'm saying here? Uh, yes. And so, yeah, I'll, yeah. So to be honest, I was very frustrated with the process. Um, you know, I, I could have sold this house and bought a new one with the fence faster than this process. So I, I did get a little frustrated. I started to put it up. Um, I spoke to the inspector and I stopped and I moved forward with trying to get the permit approved. Um, so, and actually, this was a mistake. What's built right here is uh, I was working that day and my friend, he built right where the sidewalk and the uh, driveway meets. I actually want that to be offset at an angle. So I have full visibility uh, pulling it out of my driveway. Yep. So um, the plan that I have submitted here, yeah, as you can see where the sidewalk and driveway meet, I'm mm -hmm. gonna cut that, I want to cut that post down, angle it from that, from the sidewalk to the side of the driveway. So I have full visibility there. That's the biggest distinction. Great, thank you. Uh, Adam? 
Uh, mostly here just to clarify that site plan because that I think that's what I saw what was submitted. I think that angle is important for for any sight lines as you're backing on the driveway and you know to see people that are on the sidewalk if there are any kids or 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 whoever. So as long as there's some sight line right there, I think we're we're fine with with the the site plan overall. Great, uh, Councilman. Thank you, and um, you know I'm I'm supportive of this as presented. Uh, I I do think that the practical difficulty is that it's a corner lot, so if, if as as opposed to a mid block lot uh, where there's kind of a natural containment, a corner lot doesn't have that. And then also, uh, you know, section six hundred three of the code uh, related to dog nuisances, you know, is pretty clear about uh, you know dogs not being allowed to bark for long durations of time. So, so I understand the residents' uh, desire to kind of ha have that privacy fence so that the neighbors aren't being uh, you know bothered by uh, a, a dog barking for longer than fifteen minutes at a time, with, which is an, an issue. Uh, within the city charter, I did speak with the residents directly across uh, West 162nd Street, uh, which is the side street. Uh, and uh, the, I know notices were sent out. I, I would presume them to be the the most affected, and and they were supportive of this as well. Great, thank you, Councilman. Uh, Board, uh, any questions or comments? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Chair, uh, just a question to uh, Mr. Hines: What kind of dog do you have? A uh, Shiba Inu. Mix. Okay. She's about All 30 right. pounds. Yeah. Okay. So active, active little, active little dogs. Yeah. They're known to be escape artists for sure. <laughs> right. They are. Absolutely. Uh, Madam Chair, I think it's prudent that this fence go up. I think is, uh, we've heard testimony from city planning and the support of Compliments Life. Uh, so with that in mind, I move that we support calendar number 21 124. Second. All right, call the roll, please, Ms. Gokla. Ms. Faith? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Donovan? Yep. yep. Ms. Barnes? Okay. Ms. Britt? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Chair One. I didn't hear her either. Oh, I heard Ms. Barnes. I didn't hear you. Oh, you did? Oh, I didn't. Um, and I didn't hear my name either. Uh, okay, but yes. <laughs> oh, I must have cut out. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so calendar number 21-124 is granted with the understanding that the site plan shown showing the Chamford corner is the uh, final site plan. It'll be ratified next week and we will send you a letter. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, moving on to... Franklin. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't have Councilman Bashir Jones with us. No, I don't see him. Okay. So, um, one second, let me flip back. So, moving on to calendar number 21-125 at 4815 Franklin Boulevard. Chaz Cortez, owner, proposes to erect a three-story 12,750 square foot 24 unit residential building in a B1 two family residential district. The owner appeals for relief from the strict application of the Cleveland codified ordinances as stated in the agenda and the public record. Of note, the applicant seeks BZA approval of site plan differing from that, which was approved by the BZA in calendar number 19-305 issued on January 27th, 2020 and which resulted in a permit number B20011302 issued no November 5th, 2020. Uh, we will see that in the highlighted areas of our um, uh, calendar number, those are the items that are new that we're addressing today. To Mr. Donovan. Everyone for this case who's about to testify, kindly raise your right hand. Again, I'll read a statement. I'm looking for a response of I do with your name and address. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Uh, Kyle Hulawat, 2019 Center Street, Cleveland, Ohio. I do. Jordan Fitzgerald, 2019 Center Street, Cleveland, Ohio. I do. Alan Renzi, 2019 Center Street, Cleveland, Ohio. I do, David Bowen, uh, 2100 Center Street, Cleveland, Ohio. 
I do, Scott Staley, 4724 Franklin Boulevard. I do, Don Pettit, 601 Lakeside Avenue. Anyone else? Hearing none, we move to uh, history. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. I would just state that the history can be found in calendar number 19-305. You have received the resolution um, showing you the uh, the particulars of the last case. If uh, if you'd like, Madam Chair, I could read the, the history from that calendar 19-305, but I figured that in the um, interest of time, you would just want me to reference it and uh, for anyone who would want to research this at a later time. You are correct. All right, let's move on to legal standard, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Appellant is requesting a use variance and area variances from the maximum gross floor area, minimum lot size, off street parking, screening, side yard encroachment, maximum building height, fencing, and landscaping regulations of the zoning code. To obtain the use variance, appellant must prove that denying the request will result in an unnecessary hardship, particularly to the property, such there will be no economically feasible use of the property without the variance, will deprive the appellant of substantial property rights, and the granting the variance will not be contrary to the purpose and intent of the zoning code. To obtain the area variances, appellant must prove that denying the request will create a practical difficulty, not generally shared by other lander buildings in the same district will deprive the appellant of substantial property rights and the granting the variances will not be contrary to the purpose and intent of the zoning code. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Maurice, can we have a summary, please? This is a lot. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a good one. Uh, so basically what happened here is we have uh, a parking lot that was built different than uh, what was what this board approved, I believe last year or recently. Um, uh, they reduced the size of the parking lot, um, and they did all this without uh, getting uh, new approvals. Um, so they are short 15 parking spaces under this new uh, layout. They also have no uh, landscaping and screening along the edge of the parking lot. There is no setback problem that was already dealt with before. And I'm also not sure if there was a required dumpster uh, enclosure for this. Okay, thank you. Uh, who's going to be a spokesperson for, for this project? Uh, both uh, Jordan and I will be will be talking on this project. Uh, Jordan, and who are you? Uh, Kyle for the lot. Kyle, okay. Go ahead. All right, so as Ms. Kuklo already mentioned, some of these items have already been addressed. This is the adjudication items that we received for this hearing. The highlighted items were approved and adopted by the Board of Zoning Appeals on January 27th of 2020. Um, today, we are seeking a parking variance. We are required to have 24 off street parking spaces, and we can only fit 15 spaces on the site. We originally received a parking variance for 20 spaces. Um, we would like to amend that variance. That is item number four. Items seven, eight, nine, and yeah, seven, eight, and nine. Um, as you will see later in our presentation, our design conforms. And then item number 11, that one no longer applies. Next slide. Next slide, please. So this is a copy of the resolution from the hearing back in January 27th of 2020 with those highlighted items recognized. These were already approved by BZA. Next slide. This is the, the updated um, uh, parking layout. We have 15 spaces on site. And previously, the owner uh, ownership had an agreement with the church lot across the street for an additional four spaces. That lease agreement has been amended for an additional 10 spaces, bringing us to a total of 25 spaces, 25 off street spaces provided for this building. Um, next slide. 
This is the updated lease agreement with the 10 spaces provided in the lot. Uh, next slide. You want to talk about this? Yeah. So we were asked to show kind of um, the overall plan, the paving, and the drainage of this parking lot. So the next three slides show some of the civil plans. This one right here shows the, the overall layout and the extents of the pavement. Uh, next slide, please. This shows that we have a catch basin in the parking lot, which ties into the uh, storm drain at street. And then the next slide, please. And then this shows the grading plan of the parking lot, how everything slopes towards that catch basin. Next slide. So we originally pr presented these, uh, these following two slides in our original presentation about um, kind of the, the standard of, of parking throughout the city. Um, generally, it's a lot of these buildings have one space per unit um, or less. So this is kind of a, a brief survey and some of the trends that we're seeing in, in urban type areas. Um, next slide. And this is to illustrate that there's plenty of uh, on-street parking as well as the 25 spaces that we're providing off-street. Um, it is also in walking distance uh, to a bus stop as well. And next slide. And again, this is a quick survey of some uh, surrounding properties that have either one space per unit or less than one space per unit. And again, we'll be providing 25 spaces for the 24 units uh, we have on site. Uh, next slide. So this is to show that we are within the side yard. Uh, we are three feet um, around the entire building and the parking lot from the surrounding property lines. So we conform with this. Um, next slide. We established a 10 foot setback along Franklin. Um, so again, we, we feel we conform with this front setback. Um, next slide. And then we are 35 feet from grade to the mid rise of the roof, uh, again, conforming with the uh, height restriction. And then uh, next slide. And the parking lot fence has been removed from the project itself. Uh, so we feel this is not applicable anymore since we have re removed that fence. And um, that's that I think that's the last slide. Okay, um, let me hear from uh, Mr. Pettit now. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this was a this this project was approved by the Landmarks Commission in January of 2020. Uh, and uh, I and we we supported the variance back then. Uh, I'm still confused about the adjudication that was written up for the uh, calendar item today, uh, and and I'm easily confused these days. But uh, you know, I spoke to the I spoke to the architect last week, and I was made aware of a few changes that have been made to the plan since we approved it over a year ago, and I'm willing to work with the applicant through those changes. Uh, I have no objection to the parking variance here, but my real concern is how the rear property has shrunk somehow since we saw it last time. And I'm still trying to, I'm struggling with understanding that. My real concern is that we've lost all of the landscaping uh, in the rear of the property along Wales Court. Uh, including the dog run, including the outdoor entertainment area, the bike storage. Uh, the landscaping was pretty minimal to begin with. And I guess my only issue today is that uh, there's is the complete lack of landscaping. And I'm just I'm I would ask the applicant if there's any opportunity to reinstate any of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um... Would someone like to answer Mr. Pettit's questions, please? So when, when we initially brought this, this project up, um, we, we had just, it was a conceptual site plan. We hadn't yet had an engineer 
um, survey yet. And I think that that's where, you know, it's, it's some of the differences have come into play, um, you know, once we got that survey and, and we're able to, to fully engineer it. And then we, it was brought to our attention that the parking was, was less than what we had originally um, provided. So we worked with, with the building owner to amend the, the lease with the uh, lot across the street to make sure that we had um, ample parking um, provided for the building itself. It's what yeah, it, it, it's what we was was submitted to um, for permit and building and housing. Um, you know, being that it, that it that it's not done, um, you know, I think we can work with ownership to get get the landscape, make sure that we provide the landscape in there uh, to get the buffer back there. Um, so what was the reason why it's not in there now? I, I, I don't know. Honestly, I, I don't know why the, the contractor um, covered the entire site. Um, yeah, this was not a, a design decision that was approved by the architect. Um, it was just, it was something that was, was done without our knowledge. And who's that speaking? This is Jordan Fitzgerald. Okay, Jordan. All right. Just announce who you are for yeah. and have a proper record. Okay. Um, is anyone from city planning here or it's is it just you, me, but I believe okay. we do have Scott Staley, a, a neighbor that wanted to make some comments. Okay. Go ahead, Scott. I, and um, I have his letter here. Yeah, thank you very much. I submitted a letter and and some of the items on the letter based on what I've heard so far are not valid, I guess. I also have the same concern as how did they lose all that space? And I thought there was 23 spaces originally put in that back and all of a sudden now they only have room for um, 15. So uh, they said they have a agreement with the church, but I live in the neighborhood and that church only has 22 marked parking spaces in it so now the apartment comp and it's a very vibrant church there's there's you know on sundays of course and um and then meetings during the week i just don't see how the church is really going to give up those spaces um you know half the spaces that they have to this apartment complex uh based on this picture i did not see because there's dumpsters at the end so i did not count those spots in the end I didn't notice that they were there. But still, it's a significant portion of that lot. So I'm just worried about street parking. Um, I have three properties that would be affected by this, and I'm just worried about the number of street street parking that's going to occur. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maurice? Yes. Planning um, perspectives. Oops, let me uh, go back to the site, to the pictures. Yeah, so uh, I'm really concerned about the fact that there is no fencing or screening of the adjacent properties. Uh, I'm looking at the picture in the upper left, the White House next door. I really feel that there should be at least a board-on-board -board fence there. Uh, I know if I lived there, I wouldn't want to have 15 cars with their headlights coming into my backyard and into the back of my house in the evening every time somebody pulled in and pulled out. And I, I think it would be the same thing along Wales Court, the house that's right there. Those cars are facing directly into the, that building, that uh, residence right there. Uh, and you're going to have car lights going into uh, that house at all hours. Um, so I think it should be a combination of, a, of at least a board on board fence to block those headlights. Uh, and as Mr. Pettit uh, also talked about, uh, there should be some probably some landscaping back there, not just some gravel. Uh, and I'm also wondering about in the site plan shows a, a dumpster enclosure that's fenced. Is that that actually part of that? This is Jordan. Uh, there will be a dumpster enclosure. It just has not been constructed yet. It will be board on board. Hey, Jordan, um, do you hear the concerns of city planning as far as the uh, board on board fence for the uh, neighbors? Um, and you did address, so you will be replacing the landscaping, although you're saying you had a road contractor and he paved everything. So 
what's the plan to uh, put the landscaping back as well as considering um, what city planning said about board on board fencing to um, screen out the neighbors? There will be a board on board fence between uh, the parking lot and the property to the west. The owner of this property is working with the other property owner to um, come up with that fencing right now. Um, as far as the landscape, not everything is done yet. You can see that um, they temporarily put in some river rock. Uh, there's still the opportunity to put in some planting on either side. Um, and we can add some screening back in um, landscaping between the alleyway and the parking lot if necessary. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Donovan. It seems to me that uh, we're basically designing the uh, solution here at at our yep, live and, and in person. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it behooves the project uh, to have uh, take a step back, get everybody in the room, let's figure out what's going to happen and what's not going to happen. That it could happen, it should happen, it maybe it'll happen answers so that we have a site plan that we're working on that delineates the, the information so that everybody at least can work off the same thing. Madam Chair, I would agree with Mr. Donovan that this needs to be postponed and the appellants need to come up with a site plan that addresses all these issues. Um, quite frankly, uh, I'm not sure, you know, all these, the, all of a sudden the building move, all of a sudden there's less parking, all of a sudden we have number 10 gravel instead of landscaping, all of a sudden we have asphalt that runs all the way over the back of the property. I mean, who's really in charge of this project? This looks to me, I'm, I'm really pretty annoyed about this. Um, this looks to me very much like nobody's in charge, like let's do what we want and ask forgiveness later. So I want them to go back. I want them to address all these issues. I want them to come back to us with a complete and thorough site plan. I want to see a planting schedule. I want to see uh, fence cut, fence cut uh, sheets, and I want to see this all problem solved. This is really unacceptable in my book. Okay, the board has spoken. <laughs> uh, well, yes, someone make a motion to uh, postpone this case. Madam Chair, I'll, I'll make, make the motion that we postpone the case to allow the applicant and the neighborhood concerns and, and city agencies to get together to hammer out a final site plan that will be reviewed for whatever variances it, it uh, concludes are needed. I have a second. Second it. Thank you. Call the roll, please, Ms. Cooper. Ms. Barnes. Yes. Ms. Bate. Yes. yes. Mr. Donovan. Yes. Ms. Britt. Yes. yes. Liz, what's the next date we can give them? So we can also place them on the September 13th agenda if you would like. The next date would be September 20th. Yeah, the 13th. Um, the 13th works for you? Okay, we'll put you on the 13th. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have one final case, I believe. Yes. Yes. Moving along <laughs> to calendar number 21-026. Yes at 1914 East 75th Street. Samiko's foundation owner proposes to erect a four-story, 56-unit apartment building and accessory parking lot in an M, excuse me, in an E2 multifamily residential district and an urban form overlay district. The owner appeals for relief from the strict application of the Cleveland Codified Ordinances as stated in the agenda and the public record. And I think we are, this was, uh, we are revisiting this case 
which was postponed from July 19, 2021. Everyone that will testify for this case, kindly raise your right hand. Again, I'm going to read a statement. I'm looking for a response of I do and your name and address. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do, Deborah Lewis at 1878 East 75th Street. Thank you. Next. I do, Katie Gillette of uh, City Architecture, uh, 12205 Larchmere Boulevard. Thank you. Next. I do, uh, Chris Shackton, Famicos Foundation, 1350 Ansel Road. Thank you. Next. I do, Lothario Marchman, Famicos Foundation, 1325 Ansel Road. Thank you. Next. I do, Jarvis, I do, Jarvis Gibson, 1911 East 73rd. Thank you. Next. I do, John Analifo, Famicos Foundation, 1325 Ansel Road. Thank you. Next. I do, Kim Scott, Cleveland City Planning, 601 Lakeside Avenue. Thank you, Kim. Next. I do, Alex Pesto with City Architecture, 12205 Larchmere Boulevard. Thank you. Next. Last call. Hearing none, we move to history. Or maybe not. Yeah, we don't need history. Uh, legal standard, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Appellant is requesting area variances from the height above grade and off street parking requirements of the zoning code. To obtain the area variances, appellant must prove that denying the request will create a practical difficulty not generally shared by other land or buildings in the same district, will deprive the appellant of substantial property rights, and the granting the variances will not be contrary to the purpose and intent of the zoning code. Thank you, Maurice. Yes, Madam Chair, um, the, the main reason this was postponed was uh, because uh, community input was lacking and the community input that we did have at the meeting, uh, although the property is properly zoned, uh, there was some pushback from the residents about putting a multifamily house or multifamily building here. Uh, the, the, the violations we're looking at are the fact that the, the uh, finished floor uh, should be 18 inches and they were at zero and also a screening of the uh, the main parking area. Thank you. Okay. Um, and so in the interest of time, um, we are gonna go through everyone, but just want everyone to know that these are, you know, very minor variances. And so you have to keep your comments to the variances that are are listed here today. Um, we, we've had testimony before on this. We had a very long, um, exhaustive testimony before on this. And so if you testified in the previous case, if you're testifying today, make sure your comments are just to the zoning variances, as well as something new that you need to talk about that you did not speak about previously. So with that being said, um, who's going to be a spokesperson for the case right now? Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. This is Chris Shafton from Famicos Foundation. Okay, um, Chris, go ahead. Good morning, Commission members. Thank you so much for taking the time um, to review this case um, for what we hope is the last time. Um, so this again is the Chester 75 project um, located currently at 1914 E75th. Um, with me this morning is uh, Katie Gillette, uh, from City Architecture, as well as Alex Pesta, in addition to my colleagues, um, our Executive Director, John Alifo, as well as our Construction Project Manager, Lothario Marchman. Um, as has already been mentioned, we've been here previously and presented this case, so I'll skip over um, project details to just give you a brief update on what we've done since the previous meeting. Um, as requested um, by this body, um, we scheduled a community a community meeting um, the Tuesday um, following our initial uh, presentation. And so we were able to bring about 30 uh, community members um, in into the room. We both did a notice um, 
to residents as well. So we did both a hand dropped notice as well as a mailed notice to residents and got very nice turnout. We have representations from city planning at that meeting as well. Um, and so we had a very in depth and detailed conversation with the residents, very passionate. They made it very clear to us um, that they would like to see continued communication um, and were disappointed with the lack of communication they felt happened um, during the project period. Um, we vowed to correct that. They requested a follow up meeting the following week, which we obliged um, and conducted a second meeting um, on the Tuesday following that. So that was July 20th. Um, where we had again about 25 residents in the room um, and discussed um, again their concerns and tried to put a plan together in order to address them. Since then, um, our executive director, John Alifo, has had continued conversations with community members um, to get additional details on how we can, as um, the developer and community development corporation, continue to provide um, assistance and direction. Um, and um, just overall good stewardship for this project um, to the residents of the community. Um, they have since developed a bulleted list of those activities um, that we will continue to um, update them on this project into the future. We will assist them with planning um, a streetscape project amongst some other um, details um, that they have requested. Um, so with that, I will turn over to Katie Gillette to jump into the presentation. Sure, thanks, Chris, um, and thank you, uh, board members. I will just quickly recap um, the, the two variances at hand. Um, and um, Maurice, if you don't mind going to the site plan, I can speak to um, the parking variance first. This one? Um, or the slide one. before it, actually. How about that one? Yep, perfect. Um, so, uh, as a recap, um, regarding the, the parking variance, um, for this site, uh, the, there is, uh, an urban form overlay on this site, which, uh, requires that parking is located behind the building entirely. Um, and because the uh, address of the site is along, uh, East 75th street, that is considered the frontage for the property. Um, we've inquired, um, uh, in a couple occasions with the city survey department, if we can obtain a, a Chester address for the site, um, so that we could avoid, uh, you know, requiring a variance here. Unfortunately, um, there are not Chester addresses, uh, in the stretch from about East 55th street to the East 90. So we, um, unfortunately that's something that we aren't able to solve that way, um, you know, from an urban design standpoint, the parking is located by what you might perceive uh, intuitively to be the frontage of the building along Chester. Um, so the, the parking spaces in the northeast corner of the site are not in compliance with the um, zoning code, and that is one of the items that we're seeking a variance for. The um, other item is in regard to the um, finished floor height uh, of the residential portions of the building on the first floor. Um, there is a slide in here with um, floor plans and uh, if you can flip to that one, Maurice. Yep, perfect. Um, so looking at the, the first floor uh, plan on the left here, the uh, yellow and orange tones, those are residential spaces, the blue um, and the gray, those are circulation or service or amenity spaces within the building. Um, the urban form overlay requires the residential spaces are 18 inches uh, above grade. Um, unfortunately, that poses a lot of challenges uh, from a constructability standpoint, balancing that with accessibility codes and requirements. Um, and that is the, the main impetus um, for us to seek a variance here. We understand that the intent of the, the code there is to um, provide security and privacy um, for the residents that are on the first floor. Um, so to address that, um, along Chester Avenue, you'll see there are three townhome units. Those townhome units, the, the bedrooms um, are located up on the second floor of the units. Um, otherwise, uh, windowsill heights have been raised um, in the first floor units, so they're two feet above grade, um, whereas in the upper floors, they extend much closer uh, to the floor. Um, and we also are providing uh, landscaping to help create that buffer and screen between the um, residential units themselves and um, the street. 
That's a general recap um, of the two variances at hand. I'm now going to turn it over um, unless there are uh, questions from the board on this. I'm going to turn it to Alex to provide a, a little bit more update um, on the community engagement. Okay. Keep it brief, Alex, but let's go. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Alex Pesto with City Architecture. I will keep it extremely brief since Chris already did an outline of the community engagement. So just a reminder that we had two meetings since the last time this this group convened that was on July 13th and July 20th. Chris already reported out. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, let me hear from uh, Kim Scott, please. Good morning, board. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> as has already been stated, um, this project has gone through a variety of um, meetings and discussions to address the concerns of the residents uh, to really passionate meetings. Uh, one that I wasn't in attendance at and the other I was not. However, my colleague Marka Fields attended. Um, and Famicos has um, made a commitment as Mr. Analifo had said, I think, or Chris, I'm, I'm not sure, forgive me, uh, has said would be working with the community. And I think um, a part of the mistrust has taken place um, as a result of the way the information was communicated from the beginning with the community members. And so I'm hoping at this point now that all of that has been amended and that we can move forward um, with a good development project in consideration of all of the concerns that uh, residents in the immediate community have regarding this project. So as stated previously, um, city planning is in support of this. And I know, although um, the issues at hand were the parking unscreened and the height of the first floor, I guess, I just wondered, uh, and, and uh, Alex or um, Katie, maybe you can address whether the landscaping between your project property and the resident to the west immediately um, had been um, finalized. And outside of that, city city planning is in support. Uh, yes, this is Katie. Um, to address your question, um, Kim, the landscaping with, on the western side of the, the site has been um, addressed and we had Previously, some conversations with the homeowner there, and we, uh, upon those conversations, we did add uh, three trees um, that will grow and provide some additional uh, screening along the western property. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, I'm going to open it to um, any residents that are on the call, and um, just also want to reiterate, you know, what I said earlier that please keep your comments brief and okay. keep them to whatever. If there's new, you know, new testimony that you have today that you did not submit at the last hearing. So I'm going to go to Ms. Lewis now. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am here to corroborate that there were indeed two meetings. They were indeed passionate and they indeed included uh, residents from adjacent neighborhoods because of the process hiccup that happened. At the end of the day, what we have is um, still concerns and skepticisms about the adequacy of uh, street parking and the viability of proposed solutions. Um, and we are looking forward to seeing how uh, we can mend this riff uh, to move forward with community um, benefits planning for the neighborhood in which we live and will continue to live so we want to have that relationship solidified and we are looking forward to that. Uh, I yield back to uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Ms. Lewis. Uh, Mr. Gibson. Yes, 
restrooms. Are you there? Yeah, they address my concern. I'm okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Um, is there anyone else from the from the uh, development team or the CDC that uh, needs something to say? We'll have something to say. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Jana Lee Yes, it's Jana Lee I'm the executive director of Amicos Foundation. I just want to collaborate what has already been said. However, I do want to add that part of that conversation has really been strong at providing a comprehensive beautification plan uh, for this for the uh, subject uh, block block area and i have made a commitment to the residents that as long as i am at famicos foundation that we are going to work with them to uh, get our architectural firm to do that particular study I haven't talked to the architectural firm either, but whatever they charge me, I will be willing to pay. What I do not know how we will deal with is how to pay for whatever recommendations that could come out of that plan. But I guess we will uh, cross that bridge when we get there. Finally, the uh, initially when we were trying to talk about this. Uh, issue about parking, we brought up the idea of uh, um, district parking at a vacant lot across the street. There wasn't that much interest on that, but last night in my conversation with Ms. Mumford and Ms. Lois, it came up again that they would like for us to reopen that conversation, and I told them I would be more than happy to do that exactly where it's going to take us we all agree nobody knows but we will have that conversation with the developer that has the right to develop on that land they were in support of it we met with them the very first meeting we had with the community and talked about it but when it was um, rejected we didn't talk about it anymore we will be revisiting it and those are the uh, two things i wanted to add Great. Thank you, Mr. Analifo. Uh, before I turn it over to the board, I just want to commend everyone for coming to the table several times and meeting with the community and coming up with uh, with agreements or uh, or ways to uh, to soothe everyone's mind about this project. So I just want to commend everyone for uh, having a good community process here. Um, board, if you any questions or concerns, if not, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Liz. Yes, Liz. And if I could remind um, anybody who is on the call to use star six to unmute yourself. I do see some other names that I'm not sure if they got to speak. I had a list of names here. So every other people are from the project team, but I believe I have the all the residents have spoken. Mr. Marchman or Lothario Marchman spoke. He's part of the project team. Thank you. Yes, I'm okay. I'm sorry. I'm Lisa Lothario Marchman. Um, everything Chris John said. I have no further comment. Thank you. Lord. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I think you and I both commented at the previous. Uh, hearing that had this building had a. Uh, Chester Avenue address, uh, things might be different. Um, I, I would echo your comments that the community engagement uh, that has taken place during the postponement has been excellent and I think will lead to positive results going forward uh, between uh, liaison between Famicos, uh, this facility and the community. So I think that's excellent. Um, with all that being said, um, I think we can go ahead now and approve calendar number 21-026 for the uh, two variances that they are seeking. Second. Thank you. Call the roll, please, Ms. Google. Uh, Madam Chair, for clarification, <clears throat> I believe that the applicant has stated that the first floor has been raised to uh, two feet off the ground and that they no longer need that um, section 348.04 variance. Mr. Pesta is shaking his head no. Yeah, no, I didn't get that. 
Okay. I didn't hear that at all either. All right, we will add that in then. I mean, yeah, we will leave that on the uh, variant. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Barnes? Ms. Barnes, yes. Ms. Barnes, yes. Thank you. Mr. Donovan? Yes. Ms. Faith? Yes. Ms. Britt? Yes. Calendar 21-026 is granted. It'll be ratified next week, and we will send you a letter. Thank you, everyone. On to Thank, the you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Good, Good luck. luck. Thank you. Or we'll we appreciate that. Thank you. On to old business. Uh, one through six without objection. Without, without objection. objection. All right, that's it. We are adjourned. Awesome. All right. We do have a uh, new member that will be starting soon. Yes. 